you ever wonder what the Hebrew scriptures really say about marriage and divorce? I could tell you a dry, boring, technical story, or we could talk about a love story. Because that's what scripture really is, is the world's greatest love story. It's also a story about marriage and divorce. And we're going to talk about these things. But in scripture, we have a man who finds a maiden that he dearly loves. And then he loses this maiden. She runs off from him. She runs away from him. But he loves her so much, he doesn't let her go. He seeks her out. And finally, she returns to him. We read about this in Jeremiah chapter 3, starting in verse 1, where it talks about how Yahweh, the eternal, the creator of heaven and earth, has divorced his bride, called Ephraim, or the house of Israel, the lost ten tribes. It says, they say, if a man divorces his wife, and she goes from him and becomes another man's, may he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you've played the harlot with many lovers. Yet, return to me, says Yahweh. We drop down to verse 8. It says, Then I saw for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So the house of Israel had committed adultery with foreign Elohim or foreign gods. And Yahweh, in his righteousness, he'd written the house of Ephraim, or the lost ten tribes, a certificate of divorce, put it in her hand, and sent her out of his house. We'll see that come up in Deuteronomy 24 later. Then in verse 12, it says, But Yahweh loves his bride, and he says, Therefore, go and proclaim these words toward the north, and say, Return backsliding Israel, says Yahweh. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful. I will not remain angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity, that you've transgressed against Yahweh your Elohim, and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree. And you've not obeyed my voice, says Yahweh. He pleads with us. He says, Return, O backsliding children, says Yahweh, for I am married to you. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Now, did you catch that? In verse 8, Yahweh says that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, he'd put backsliding Israel away and had given her a certificate of divorce. So he's divorced Israel, complete with a divorce certificate. But yet in verse 14, he says, Return, O backsliding children, says Yahweh, for I am still married to you. So what we see here is that the standards in Scripture are different than the standards that are used today. Divorce in Scripture does not terminate a marriage covenant vow. Very important point, and the rest of the study is going to be based on that. Divorce does not terminate a marriage covenant vow. We see something very similar. We're going to start to get a, an understanding of the heart of Yahweh our Elohim in the book of Hosea or Hoshea, starting in chapter 1 and verse 2. And it says, When Yahweh began to speak by Hoshea or Hosea, Yahweh said to Hoshea, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from Yahweh. So what he's really saying here is, I want to show the people what it's like. I'm loving them so much. It's on my heart. I love them. But they're just continually committing harlotry against me. So I want them to see through your example. I want you to show them. They're, they're not hearing me. They're not listening to me. So I want you to show them a proper example of how a man should love his wife. This is the book of Hosea. So Hosea 1 and verse 3, it says, So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Dropping down to chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Then Yahweh said to me, Go again, love a woman. He's still talking about Gomer. So he's taken this harlot for a bride. And he's loved her, he's married her, she's borne him several children. 
but she's still running off. She's still selling herself into adultery. She's still selling herself into harlotry, just like the children of Israel, Ephraim, the lost ten tribes. So he says, go again. Love a woman. Love your wife Gomer. Love her. Love your wife Gomer. Even though she's loved by a lover and she's committing adultery against you. And the people will see this is just like the love of Yahweh for the children of Israel who look to other Elohim or other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. He says, So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half homers of barley. So what we see here is that even though Hosea's wife was committing adultery, he didn't divorce her, he didn't abandon her, he didn't send her away, he went even to buy her back. Now that's love. Not only did he not walk away when he could have, he went to buy her back. You know, and Scripture's all about love. If Yahweh isn't about love, then what's Scripture all about? We need to bear that thought in mind. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Messiah loved the Ecclesia and gave himself for her. So exactly in this same way ought husbands to love their own wives as their own bodies. He says, for he who loves his wife loves himself. So if you don't love your wife, do you love yourself? So if you love your neighbor as you love yourself, but you don't love yourself, how can you love your neighbor? Just something to think about. In order to make sense of these things, we're going to have to have an understanding of what the difference is between Yahweh's laws, his statutes, his ordinance, and his judgments. Now, all through Scripture, in the Torah, Yahweh has laws, statutes, and ordinances, and these all pertain to when things are going normally. When things are going the right way, we follow laws, statutes, and ordinances. Just like you have an ordinance, no parking here, or no dumping here, or we have a law that you, you know, don't shoot people. You know, Yahweh forbid that we should do something like that. But there's laws against harming other people. There's ordinances about how we can get along together in society. Yahweh has these same kinds of laws. But then when things go wrong, then we have a judgment. When things go wrong, you go stand in front of a judge, and the judge will issue a judgment. So what a judgment is meant to do, judgments are very different than laws, statutes, and ordinances. Judgments are meant to make the best of a bad situation. So in Leviticus, or Vayikra, chapter 20 and verse 10, we're going to see an example of a law or a statute. Now it says, The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress, they shall surely be put to death. Now that's a law. Now let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 24, starting in verse 1. This is not a law. This is a judgment. This is where things have gone terribly, completely wrong. We've got a train wreck situation here, and we're just trying to make the best of a bad situation. Let's, let's read it closely. It says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes, because he's found some uncleanness in her. And we take that word back to the Hebrew. It's the word erva, which refers to bearing the pudenda. So, it's some kind of a sexual uncleanness or a sexual a bearing of the pudenda. We don't know if she's walking around naked in public. We don't know if she's uh, committing adultery with the neighbors. Whatever she's doing, she's, she's bearing her, her genitals. She's bearing her pudenda publicly. She shouldn't do that. So it says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that he finds no, she finds no favor in his eyes because he's found some matter of uncleanness in her, and then he writes her certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house to cause her to repent. So the whole purpose of this is, you know, just imagine the situation. Imagine the scenario. So the husband is saying, honey, you can't do that because a husband is supposed to love his wife. This is not, people look on this and they say, well, see, the Torah says that we can divorce. See, it says right there in Deuteronomy chapter 24. See, divorce is okay. If she commits adultery, I can divorce her. If I don't like her, I can divorce her. If I find some matter of uncleanness in her, what'd she do? She didn't clean the bathroom. I can divorce her. I just don't like her. She doesn't wash her clothes. They're unclean. I can divorce her. That's not what this means. What this means is some matter of sexual uncleanness. She's bearing her pudenda. So, 
And this is something he shouldn't do. We saw that Hosea went to get back his bride. We saw that, that Yahweh went to get back his bride. But even Yahweh wrote Ephraim a certificate of divorce and sent her, put it in her hand and sent her out of his house. And the whole point was to cause her to repent. We need to understand that. We're going to talk more about this as it goes along. This is not saying that you have to divorce her if she commits adultery. This is saying that the man has the authority to issue her a certificate of divorce because a man has to maintain order in his own household. So whatever he has to do, but this is a last resort kind of a thing. This is not something you should be doing. After all, Hosea was sent to the people to show the people the kind of love that Yahweh has for, th for us, for us. But in this particular case, the man, he can't get, he can't get order in his house any other ways. Honey, you're, you're committing adultery against me. You, you're, 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 you're walking around naked in the street. You're sleeping with the neighbors. This is, you, you can't do this. We've been talking about this. You can't do this anymore. I can't have this. Uh, well, okay. And she says, talk to the hand. She says, I'm not listening to you. I reject your headship. Yeah, yeah. I know you're my husband. Talk to the hand. Go away. Don't bother me. You know, I don't report to you. you you're, you're not, yeah, you're my husband, but, but you're not my head. And he's like, Whew, wow, okay, what am I going to do now? <sighs> okay, it's, I'm, I have to maintain order in my own household, so what am I going to do? He's like, honey, you've left me no choice. The only thing I can do, I have to write you a certificate of divorce. I'm going to put it in your hand, and you're going you're gonna to be out in the street tonight. You know, I, I can't, and, you know, you're not taking credit cards, you're not taking money, because the whole point of this thing is to cause her to repent. It's not like it is today in Western society where you, you just get a divorce and everything splits. That's not how it is in Scripture. But he, he writes her certificate of divorce and sends her basically out in the street to sleep in the cold. And the, the, it, brutal. But she's left him no choice because the punishment, the punishment for adultery is death by stoning. And so she's, she's really, she's put him in a no-win situation. He has to do something in order to gain control of his own household. So he writes a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, sends her out of his house, and then in verse 2, now what she should do, what she should do is spend the night in the street and go, you know what, this isn't so good. You know, and so as the husband is putting the certificate of divorce in her hand, he's saying, come, please come see me for breakfast. Please come, let's talk come morning. I, I love you. I'm commanded to love you. I'm not commanded to divorce you and put you away. I'm commanded to love you as I love my own self. So please come see me for breakfast. But verse 2, if she's departed from his house, and then she goes and becomes another man's wife. Now this is why it's a judgment. What should she have done? It was bad enough that she was bearing her pudenda in public. She's sleeping around with the neighbors. She's posing for some magazine or something. That's bad enough. But then he writes her certificate of divorce, sends her out, and it's, it's like, I hope so much, Yahweh, please let me see her for breakfast. Please let me see her for breakfast. But she doesn't do that. She's departed from his house, and she goes, and because she's not, I'm not sleeping out in the street. What do you, what do you think? I'm not, forget that. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not playing this Torah Shemora. Who cares? You know what I mean? So she's departed from his house, and then she goes and becomes another man's wife. Okay, you know, she goes down to the local bar and gets picked up, gets married, whatever they do. It's, you know, this is why it's a judgment. In other words, she remarries, which is something she should not do. Verse 3, and if the latter husband also detests her, why does he detest her? Of course, because she hasn't changed her ways. She hasn't learned to repent. She hasn't said, you know what, I'm getting married. I'm going to obey my husband's authority in my house. So the husband she goes to, she goes down to the bar, she gets picked up. She hasn't learned anything. She, she hasn't figured it out yet. And so, of course, the latter husband detests her, and he also writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand. Why? Because she's married some other, she, the, the guy she married, she probably married him because he doesn't want to keep the Torah. So he also writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. Or if the second or the latter husband dies who took her as wife, it's not saying he has to do, he's saying if he dies, verse 4, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she's been defiled. That's the main point. 
for it's an abomination before Yahweh. And you shall not bring sin on the land which Yahweh your Elohim has given you as an inheritance. What this is really saying, what this passage really says is, the man and his wife, they should work it out. They're one flesh. But, and he should love her as he loves himself. But if she's not willing to obey, he has to send her out in order to maintain and establish his authority in the household. But she doesn't come back to him. She goes and marries some other man. What this says is that permanently and completely severs the marital relationship between them. When she remarries, she's made a vow with another man. So her earlier vow is now defiled. The earlier vow is defiled. She's made another vow with another man. So the, the first covenant is completely broken and can never be restored. That's what it's saying. So we're going to see several principles here. And one of the things we need to understand, I know we're living in the after the 1970s with the whole feminist movement and the whole unisex generation and this whole kind of thing. What we're going to see is that because men and women are different, the rules for men and women are different. So when a woman remarries or when a woman marries another time, it irrevocably severs all of her earlier marital vows. So we need to bear these things in mind and we need to keep things in perspective. And a lot of people get really touchy because I think over half of us are affected by a divorce in some way, divorce and remarriage. But let's take a look at Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. Shaul is telling us that truly these times of ignorance Elohim overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. So if you didn't know these things, now you know. So we were ignorant before. This isn't intended to judge anyone. Most of us have spotted pasts, and what's happened to our, us in our lives before salvation took place before salvation. If it happened before the blood, it happened before the blood. But what we're doing here is we're trying to educate ourselves on what Scripture really says because our goal is to make a better world for our children. And that's so important. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 24, we're told, Brethren, let each one remain in that state in which he was called. Other versions read, let each one remain in the calling in which he is called. Now, what we're really talking about here, now, if you have a divorce and remarriage prior to coming to Yeshua, prior to coming to the faith, that's something else. We're not, we're not going to concern ourselves with that in this video. The problem is that we have a lot of believers who are coming to the faith in Yeshua, and then after they come to the faith in Yeshua, then they get a divorce from another spouse who also believes. So they're not remaining in the same calling in which they're called. And that's the problem. Okay. Now, once again, it's once we're saved, after we're saved, then we become accountable. So we're not concerning ourselves with divorce prior to salvation. We are concerning ourselves with divorce after salvation in this video. The thing we need to understand about this is that marriage between two believers is a vow unto Yahweh. Now, if two non-believers go down to the courthouse and they get married, that's something else. We're not concerning ourselves with that here. What we're concerned with is two people who make a vow to Yahweh, whether it's Christians, whether it's Messianics, whether it's Nazarene Messianics. When you come under the blood of Yeshua, you're supposed to become a new creature. And that's what we're really talking about here. Now, we're going to talk about this a lot because most of us, over 50% of us, are affected so again, marriage between believers is something else. But when we make a vow to Yahweh, whether we make it privately or whether we stand on an altar, Yahweh expects us to fulfill our vows. And nothing we ever do in a courthouse can nullify a vow made to Yahweh. Yahweh's not impressed. Does Yahweh care what kinds of pieces of paper we draft in a courthouse? I don't think so. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, starting in verse 4, it says, when you make a vow to Elohim, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vowed. It's better to vow, it's better not to vow than to vow and not pay. So when we say we're going to do something to Yahweh, we've got to do it. So when you stand on the altar and you, you pray to and you say, I promise to love, honor, cherish until death parts us, that's a vow. You need to live up to that vow. 
Now, how's this for a marital vow? How about if we were to say, how do people were really to call it like it is here today? And they say, I promise to love, honor, and cherish in sickness and in health until death parts us, unless I change my mind, in which case I'll go down to City Hall and get a piece of paper, which means now Yahweh's okay with my divorce. Yahweh forbid. The thing is, when you marry a woman, when you become married, don't you really have a relationship with her for the rest of your life? And now, especially if there's children, isn't there a relationship with her for the rest of your life? But even if there's not children, when you take a vow to marry a woman, isn't there really a relationship? Isn't there really something there for the rest of your life, if we're honest about it? And can anything change that? How about his for a marital vow? I take thee as my lawful wedded wife forever, but if I divorce you, we no longer have any relationship. Yahweh forbid, right? But this is how many people are treating marital marriage, these kinds of things. We need to be honest about what we're doing when we marry or even when we just break bread. We go to the Sabbath fellowship and we break bread. We partake of the body and the blood of Yeshua. We have literally become one body. We become literally cells in his body as if, you know, I'm this cell and you're that cell and someone else is this cell and we're all cells. We have a relationship. We are now in relationship to each other. The only question is, do we have a good relationship or do we have a bad relationship? And I think right now, in, today in this movement in 2012, we have a lot of bad relationships in this movement. And what's needed is two things. It's called transparency and it's also called accountability. These are two factors that when you come under the blood, and you become part of his body, you need to be transparent, meaning you have nothing to hide, and you need to be accountable to others. It means anyone else in the body can call you on your stuff. Two very important factors. Now let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 22, starting in verse 13. Now it says, if any man, any, this is Yahweh talking, if any man takes a wife, and he goes into her, in other words, he's taken a wife, he's made his vow, and now he's consummated the marriage. So he took a vow, and now he consummated the vow. So he's taken a wife, and now he's gone into her. You're married. Okay. And then he detests her. And now what is he supposed to do? He's supposed to love her as he loves himself. But he detests her, which is something he should not do. All right? Verse 14, it says, And then he charges her with shameful conduct. In other words, he's going to lie about her. So he took a wife, she's a good woman, and he, now he's even going to lie about her. So first he took a wife, then he consummated the marriage, now he doesn't want to keep her as a wife. So now he detests her, and he's going to lie about her. He's going to charge her with shameful conduct. And he brings a bad name on her. In other words, he's talking trash about his woman. He's married to her for life. The two become one flesh. But now he's talking trash about himself, really. And he says, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found she was not a virgin. We're going to see in a moment, he's lying. Verse 15 says, Then the father and the mother, and that's really the issue, is just the fact that he's lying. It's not the question of the virginity. It's the question that he's lying. And a lot of people get that one confused. The issue is he's lying. Okay? He took a wife, whether she's a, merit, whether she's a virgin or not. He's taken a vow. Now he's consummated the vow. Okay? So then the mother and father of the young woman shall take and bring out the evidence of the young woman's virginity. They're going to bring out the wedding, the sheets from the wedding night. They're going to break the hymen, and now there's blood on the sheets. And so the parents, for her safety, they're going to hang on to those sheets. It's an important thing to do. It says, Then the father and mother of the young woman shall take and bring out the evidence of the young woman's virginity to the elders of the city at the gate. And the young woman's father shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to be to this man as a wife, and he detests her. Okay. He's saying he's not loving her. Okay. Now, we as men, now, if, if you have daughters, don't you want the man who marries your daughter to love her? And if you want someone to love your daughter as you love yourself, if you want someone, if you want your daughter's husband to, to love her as he loves himself, then 
don't we all need anyone who gets married? Aren't we required to love them? So th- there's this there's this accountability thing for the men in Torah. So the young woman's father says to the elders, he's lying. I gave my daughter to this man as a wife and he detests her. That's the real issue. He detests her. He should love her. He took a vow to love her, to love, honor, and cherish until death parted them. And now he consummated the marriage and now he detests her. Verse 17, now he's charged her with shameful conduct saying, I found your daughter was not a virgin. So it's not the issue of virginity. The issue of virginity is just how he's lying. That's how he's charging her with shameful conduct. It says, and yet look, these are the evidences of my daughter's virginity. So he's basically all he's doing here is he's proving that the, the husband is lying. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. Verse 18, then the elders of that city shall take that man and punish him. Basically what it's saying here, they're going to do whatever it takes to get that man to repent and to be broken and contrite and humble and to turn back to Yahweh. Whatever it takes, because that's what they have to do. They have to punish him. It says, and after they've punished him, if you can visualize what punishing him looks like, after they've punished him, and they shall fine him 100 shekels of silver. Now that's about, that's over three years wages. In the first century, 30 shekels was an average year's wage. So 100 shekels, that's over three years wages, and shall give them to the father of the young woman because he's brought a bad name on a virgin in Israel. It says, and she shall be his wife. He cannot divorce her all the days. And the reason why is because she hasn't done anything to justify a divorce. He vowed to love her, love, honor, and cherish as long as they lived. He consummated the marriage. He's married. She shall be his wife. He cannot divorce her all his days because she's done nothing that would justify him divorcing her, giving her certificate of divorce, putting it in her hand, and sending her out of his house. Now, what we're going to see here is some certain principles. So one is when a man commits adultery, the punishment for men is death by stoning. And the reason for that is because the men have more authority, the men are held to a higher standard of accountability. To whom more is given, more is required. So when a man commits adultery, the punishment is death by stoning. Now, Yahweh expects the men to hold each other accountable. It doesn't say that anywhere in Scripture, but it's one of those kinds of things. If I give you directions to come to our Feast of Tabernacles, I'm not going to say stop at every stop sign and stop at every red light. That's just assumed. When I give you driving directions, I'm going to expect, because that's a standard in our culture, I'm going to expect that you're going to know, stop at the stop sign, stop at red lights, you know, don't, I mean, be careful, don't hit any other cars in traffic. One of the things that's assumed in Torah is that the men are going to be honorable men. And they're also not only are they going to be honorable in themselves and love their spouses, but the men are going to hold each other accountable. Now, one thing that we saw at the start of this video, divorce is not intended to be permanent. Divorce is only intended as a temporary corrective measure. Basically, it's, it's a time out, only to be applied in cases of sexual immorality, as Yeshua was going to tell us later. And the reason why divorce was considered okay is because it's more compassionate than stoning. The law in Leviticus is the man and the woman who commit adultery, the adulterer and the adulteress, the two of them shall be put to death or in this case, when in Deuteronomy 24, the wife says, I'm not listening to you. you know, I'm, not, I'm not obeying your authority. What, what choice does he have? A man has to maintain a loving standard, a loving climate of authority. It, his, own, his own house has to be in order. We, we, things, everything has to be done decently and in order. So what divorce is, is it's a more compassionate alternative to stoning. So in other words, when she says, talk to the hand, I'm not listening to you. He's like, wow, honey, you, you're leaving me no choice. Now I've got to give you a certificate of divorce. You, you haven't left me any other option. That's the only time when divorce is supposed to happen, when she's being sexually immoral and she hasn't left the husband any other choices.